Hello everyone, I'm back <laughs> dusting off uh, the Twitch channel uh, for a friend once more. Uh, I hope this is working because I, I got different things on at the same time. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, we've got Michael here, which I'm going to reintroduce in, in a bit. And But I've got a call for you. So if you were Britain, recently you voted, you're going to have to vote again. If you're French, recently you voted, we're going to ask you to vote again. If you're from the US, soon you will vote. But before you vote for that very important one, we ask you here to head to the NE Award and vote for Michael and Action 12 Cinema. And without further ado... Hello! My name is Michael. I am the host of the RPG Academy podcast, the Farm to Fable Smallville Rewatch fancast, and uh, Johnny Come Lately game designer. I wrote my first game last year, as Caitlin was kind of uh, hinting and introducing, Action 12 Cinema, which is a GMless game all about bad action movies uh, filtered through a three-act structure using nothing but D12s. It's very silly, over-the-top, hopefully fun and somehow managed to get an any nomination. No one is more surprised than I am. Well, you, I guess you sent your six copies. Uh, that's, that's the process, right? You need to send yes. your six physical copies uh, to the members of, of the jury. Did the chipping went well? Because it's always a, a big source of stress when you send something out, especially with the label gift, not, uh, not to be taxed. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, custom can become tense and, and an issue in the way. Well, luckily, I being U.S. based, and I believe all the judges were, so I only had to go through uh, media mail. So it was actually a pretty seamless process. Uh, I'm sure you sending it would have been a lot more difficult than anyone outside the U.S. But for me, it was actually pretty painless. No, if it changed, but interestingly enough, I know people who volunteer to be judges for the NEs, but who are based outside of Europe, and they were told that it would be unfair to expect people to ship copies to Europe, which is very nice for all the game designers shipping stuff oh. from Europe to the US. Right, yeah. You you can send your stuff to us, but we're not going to send stuff <laughs> to you. Though, so I did send three copies of my book, um, two to Canada and one to Australia, because I had just some friends who wanted to support the Kickstarter, so there's some money my way. It was over $40 US to send each of those books. I think one of them was like 80 or something. It was like ridiculously expensive. It's, it's $4 in, anywhere in the US. I can send that for four dollars, but it was like forty or sixty to send it to Australia. That that's all very exciting, and I'm sure convincing people to vote for Action Twelve Cinema. Yeah. So, uh, you gave your elevator pitch. What's your longer pitch? So we got out of the elevator at Gen Con with you. You made your thing, yeah. and you're like, hey, okay, that sounds interesting. Please walk with me. Tell me more uh, about Action Twelve Cinema. Well, first of all, it's only D12s. Which are objectively the best polyhedral to D ten. D tens, nothing. D sixes. You cannot spin a D twelve like a D ten. A D ten, you have this nice spinning move, which is the best. Yeah, but that's not actually a roll. So that's like a gimmick. You know, like it doesn't count. Uh, D twelves are the best. I use nothing but D twelves, and I use a handful of them. Um, this is designed for like one shots. Like it's not a campaign sort of thing. It's like, hey, somebody can't make it tonight. We don't want to cancel. So it still plays something, but I don't have time to prep. So the book does all the prep for you. You just roll in some charts. You make a few decisions. And in like half hour or so, you will have a rough outline of a really terrible, but hopefully fun action movie, like totally over the top, silly, nonsensical. I use B movie action as sort of like a, a guidepost, but really it's more like C or D tier, like, you know, like, film school level uh, movie projects where different actors losing location. You, you know, the, the masks are like redone props from the other play that the school did last week. And that's just like so over the top and silly, but hopefully a lot of fun. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's very lighthearted, very cinematic because everything that you say happens, happens. So you don't have to worry about the dice didn't let me do the thing I wanted to do. You just say what you want to do. It happens. The dice tell you if what happened actually helped propel the story forward towards the end or not, uh, which can often, oftentimes leads to, at least for me, these really sort of fun create, creativity challenge prompts where I said that I knocked the ninja off the roof. The dice said knocking the ninja off the roof did not help me. 
So how do I reconcile that? So as I continue my turn, I now have to take those two facts and make them make sense again. So I just, for me personally, I love that sort of like creativity, problem solving. How do I make sense out of what just happened? I know that wasn't a very good pitch, but hopefully it makes sense to some people. No, it's quite good. And you know, it tells really the, the strength I found when I, I tried the game with you. And it was very early in the development of the game. So I'd be very curious to play it again now the, the finish because I, I think you, you, you change a lot of it, but you kept that. And uh, it reminds a bit like uh, Shameless Black Paris Gondo, in this, except in Paris Gondo, you roll first. It tells you if it's going to be something successful or not, and then you describe afterwards. Your way, uh, push the things. Yeah, it, there's the same concept of you have the agency of describing what actually the the dice result mean or coming up what's the what's the failure so yeah to illustrate your example i think i was thinking like a, a fast and furious scene you got a car chase and so on the villain is in the car you got this wild car chase and when we played you were very clear that we we could describe not just action by action but a full set of action the the car jumps and so on so really your imagination you you go wild you describe thing explosion the car rolling you jump out you jump out of your Lamborghini which lands on the front of the Porsche you were pursuing you roll on the ground you not killed yourself somehow uh, you caught up with the bad guy you roll the dice you failed you go to the car you open the door the bad guy is not in the car so you everything you said happened but the outcome indeed is a failure but yeah I'm, I'm totally gonna t steal that for uh, another game <laughs> sometimes yeah. You know, people who've only played traditional games, and I'm wrong, I still play traditional games. I love traditional games, but it is very like segmented, like D&D &D as an example, like the combat, they'll describe it narratively, like a whole bunch of stuff is happening, but turn by turn, I'm rolling a D20 to see if I hit you, you roll a D20 to see if you hit me, where in Action 12 Cinema, like other games, this isn't like it's unique, you could describe the entire battle, like you said, beginning to end, multiple combatants interacting one side defeated then roll your dice and determine good or bad and then you have to figure out what that means so it's a very different style of game but i think once you understand how it works it's very freeing it, it absolutely just, it's like this uh storytelling extravaganza of how how big and bold can i be knowing that if i roll poorly i still got to fix the thing I, I just said i saved the world the dice said the world wasn't saved how do I make that make sense? So I, I love that storytelling challenge prompt in there too. It's not quite, uh, <clears throat> I, I, got a, I got a description I like to use for Poet by the Apocalypse game, which is, uh, I said they are not first person role playing, they are writer's room role playing. So you have really Ooh. this position, but yeah, yours is, is not quite, it's slightly different, but uh, refreshing mm -hmm. and, uh, and interesting. What, what did you change from the, the play test I played? Do, would you remember the, uh, what was I it? I cannot remember. The, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I might be able to think like, I know some things did change, but like specifically when and where things had changed. I know the order of operations changed as far as like what steps you do for the setup and what order you do them in. Uh, that I think that changed from the time that you that you were in there because uh, I still remember uh, that role play with you. It was, that was the wizard corp one. Cause I actually used that example in the book for our bad guy. We rolled was a wizard, but we had set our movie in the eighties. So we made him like the CEO of wizard company. So he was like an evil CEO doing experiments on like homeless people. Uh, so I, I remember that play test fairly well. I, I don't, I can't like tell you specifically. I know the, probably the, one of the biggest changes that did come out late in the game was the needle drop mechanic, which might be one of my favorite oh, yeah. things in there. Uh, that came out of a play test I did on Tabletop Journeys where uh, you can change the results of a die roll if you can just like name the perfect song that would play over this action beat. And you can improve how, how drastically you can improve that roll if you actually sing the song at the table. Little influence from uh, another creative endeavor of yours, uh, a podcast called Farm to Fable. There, there we got a, a few needle drop in there. Absolutely, yep. It's a nice segue. Also, uh, one thing I love about Farm to Fable, your podcast about uh, Smallville, the Superman TV show, uh, No Tights, No Flights, uh, is that at the end you like to make a, a sort of a 
keep tracks <laughs> about a number yeah. of uh, tropes and beats being uh, used. And uh, an aspect I thought that could be even useful for, for any game, not just Action 12 Cinema, but that you find in the core book for Action 12 Cinema is the you came up with a lot of tables. I'm not sure if it random tables is actually... Well, yeah, yes, you can roll on them, but yeah, you, you went and captured a lot of tropes and documented them for villains type of scene and so on uh, in the shape of tables. So yeah, can you tell us about those tables? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, uh, tropes are just the ever present part of bad action movies. Like, like almost all movies are going to have them. The good ones either subvert them in some way or they, they do something with them. So it's not such an obvious in your face, you know, cool guys don't look at explosions type of trope. The bad action movies, they're just there. They're just textual. There's no subtext. There's no hinting. Uh, so one of the things that for the book, there's a huge section that is just like, I don't even know how many there are. There's like 12 times, like probably close to 300 of some of the most commonly used action movie tropes uh, broken down by tables. And at any time you're describing what you're doing, you're encouraged to include uh, those so types of tropes on like, just like kind of name check them. Like, but you know when you're playing the game, like, you create a list of five to that you can use as like some of the leveraging to get a bonus to your role. So like, like, oh, we, this is the scene where the fish tank will explode. So as you are narrating, you include the fact that the fish tank explodes, then that gives you a bonus die to make it easier for your dice check to be more successful. So uh, the game works in three acts. So you have act one, act two, act three. And when you start the game in act one, you you come up with a list of five tropes. It's a combination of rolling on all these charts as well as player choice because every result on the roll gives you two. And then you pick the one that you want of those two. And you can always just like, I don't like either of those. You can make up your own. But the idea is the book will help you pick five. If you don't use any of those five or say you only use two of the five, you can then choose when you mo move from act one to act two, do we want to bring any of the unused ones into act two, or do we want to create a whole new list of five? Um, or again, you can just make up your own, but in each act, you will have five specific action movie tropes that you can introduce specifically for getting a bonus to your role so that you're more likely to be successful. So remind me, <clears throat> uh, there's no pre-written adventures of any kind you you just roll forward your way and uh, is it gmless as well uh, or is there a facilitator of some kind you cut out for a second Kim, i can't hear you if you're talking oh okay can you hear me now oh, you're right yes oh, yeah okay uh, i was saying uh, uh could you remind me is it gmless and also uh you don't. You. I think you already answered that. But you. You don't have adventure. You roll tr your way through uh, <clears throat> the the table. Right. Yeah. So uh, the the common parlance I've been taught is GMless and zero prep. So like, if you wanted to kind of like play through a specific type of movie, like if you really like Fast and the Furious movies and you want to do your own version, you absolutely could do that very easily. But the game is designed so that no one has to be the facilitator or the GM. You just sit down and it'll say, okay, roll in this chart. This is what genre of movie. Is it action adventure? Is it action romance? Is it action thriller? And then, then you'll go to the next chart and say, okay, who is your main bad guy? And it could be pirates, ghosts, ninja, evil corporations, aliens, like, you know, just all the common bad action movie tropes you could think of. And then you just go through each of these charts and it basically will kind of lay out the, uh, we call it the production sheet. It'll tell you the bad guy, the plot, uh, what their goal is. So like what they're trying to accomplish. It could be, you know, harvesting ancient sites like Atlantis for power. It could be create weather phenomena. It could be to tank the stock market. It could be to start a, a music craze. Like it's all a bunch of silly nonsense. Uh, but basically the chart, if you just roll through the charts, it will give you everything you need to play other than the characters that you will create, you know, the heroes that you play. So you don't have to come to the table with any idea at all. The game does all that for you. The first time you play it, especially if you've never played a GMless game before, you know, there is going to be a little bit of a learning curve, but once you know how this game works or really any GMless game, you could get through the pre-work really quickly and get into actually 
playing, rolling, ha having fun with the dice, uh, probably within like half an hour. So for me, I, actually, I think the beginning part is still part of the game, but I know for some folks, like they want to get to the meat of the story, but you can get through it pretty quickly once you already know what you're doing. What does a character look like in a... I mean, I don't mean visually, but what, what the, right. what's, what's the content of a character sheet uh, to deal with, with such a system? So it's pretty light. Again, it's, it's a rules-light system. There's not a lot of meat to it. Um, every character has four attributes, brains, brawn, charm, and moxie. And moxie is basically a fill-in for anything that doesn't mean brains, brawn, or charm. <laughs> Uh, so it's sort of a sort of a catch-all. It also kind of means like luck or chutzpah, just sort of a the willingness to grit to do things, even though you probably shouldn't. Uh, so you have four numbers. You have a, a zero, plus one, a plus one, and a plus two to assign to those. So if you want your character to be really strong, you'd probably put your plus two in brawn. If you want to be very charming, you put your plus two in charm. And those numbers refer to the dice that you add to your dice pool. This is a D12 dice pool system. So no matter what you do, you always start with one D12. So literally no matter what happens, you will always roll at least one D12. But then you modify that pool based off of what you're doing and kind of like, like, I said I did this. Well, me, how I describe that, is it something I would be using my bronze or my brawn for, my brains? Is it charming? Is it moxie? So then you'd modify adding either zero, one, or two. You have a place for five skills that you can just make up at any time. Uh, the, the book will kind of guide you that it makes sense to try to come up with a couple before you start. But that is an action movie trope that it just turns out somebody on the crew happens to have this obscure talent that no one knew they had. And at the right possible moment, it's revealed that, oh, actually, I do know how to do that. So now we will be successful. So you're encouraged to just make up skills in the moment uh, but skills are rated either plus one or plus two so you're going to add to your dice pool with a one or two uh, and then you have a place for relationships because um, again it's very common that the people who are action movie heroes have terrible home lives or their spouse is leaving them they're losing their job they're getting you know kicked out of their home relationships with other people it could be friends family whatever and you can leverage that relationship and add to your dice pool. So as you're describing what you're doing, you start with one, modify your by your brain spawn or charm or moxie, you modify by skills if you want to, and then you have these relationships if you want to use those, and then you get your all your dice together. Normally you're going to roll between four and five. Well, well, three, four, or five is kind of the standard. If you're rolling less than three, you're probably doing something wrong. And there's one or two special cases where you will roll more, but usually you're going to roll four or five D12s are super cool not only do they count as two successes they also then do something else as well and ones are really bad they count as negative ones and you're just kind of pulling everything together you're looking for net successes and every obstacle that you face in the game is sort of like just um condensed down to an obstacle so it could be fighting godzilla is an obstacle getting through rough hour traffic would be an obstacle and you just have so many successes you have to have to get through Getting your coffee in Hudson Oak would be an obstacle, which you keep failing. It, 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 depending on the game you're, or the movie you're in, absolutely. Getting to the coffee pot without like getting stopped by your manager or getting caught at the water cooler by the gossip who you don't want to talk to. You could absolutely play like a dour office politics game with this system. It's not really designed for that, but it would absolutely work. So... All of that you told about actually uh, in Cafe Release qu quite a while ago, uh, and, and since then uh, you fulfilled your Kickstarter, you now you're nominated for, for an any and so on. Uh, I'm curious because I went through this experience to hear about what, what is it like uh, printing the books, shipping them, uh, and maybe p making them available in stores. Uh, what, what has been your post Kickstarter journey with that? It is very surreal. Like, you know, it, th this is such a small thing in like the grand scheme of the world. People who publish books and publish games, it, it, it's not even a blip on anybody's radar. But for me personally, it is literally a dream come true. Uh, you know, I, we've talked before, we've been friendly, if not you know, outright friends for many years. It has been a dream of mine to have a book on my shelf with my name on it since I was very, very tiny. I had always assumed it would be a fiction book. I've, I've been wanting to be a writer of stories and novels and stuff like that. But 
Just so having a book with my name on it has been something I've been dreaming about since I was a tiny kid. I'm no longer a tiny kid. So having the opportunity to make that happen, you know, going to Kickstarter, having people believe that I can do this by giving me their money so that I can pay to have the things done. It's very rewarding. It's very validating, but it's also stressful. Uh, again, I didn't even have that big of a Kickstarter. It's very modest in terms, but you know, I'm an anxious person by nature. You probably know that from all the things I post on discord and like my Kickstarters for my convention, but I was so just worried that I would let someone down, that, that someone that backed the book would be disappointed in it, that they would feel like they wasted their money or wasted the, the, you know, their belief in me. So I took it very seriously. And I'm very proud of the fact that I got through my timetables. I hit pretty much all of them, which I did cheat out. Like I kept adding time, but I ended up almost hitting them exactly. So that added time was really the saving grace. But um, all the all the benchmarks I had hit for is like when stuff would happen, when people would get stuff, I pretty much nailed. Uh, wow. Got the books out on time to everybody. I had like one person there's got lost in the mail, so I think I had one book that technically was late. But beyond that, all the all the dates I'd set in the Kickstarter hit. Now, one thing I will say too is I spent money that I didn't have to spend. Like if I was just trying to be like efficient, I could have gotten this book out to people probably cheaper than it was. But I also don't know if I'm ever going to get a chance to do this again. This, this is not a career for me. This is still a hobby. This, you know, my livelihood does not depend on this book doing well. It's just sort of this vanity project that I got to do. And I'm, you know, again, feel very blessed because of it, but I spent money on art that I could have probably done without. I spent money hiring extra people to help with like the layout and the graphic design and all that kind of stuff. So I put a lot of effort into it because I wanted it to be as close to perfect as I could in case this is the only one that ever happens. So that part, very, very fulfilling, but I am absolutely glad that it is done because I probably aged 30 years over that six <laughs> months process. I was freaking out. Now the anything is it is flabbergasting. I again, I don't know how how much you know about the innies. The, there is no award program that doesn't have some controversy. This one has its own sort of. Is it very insular? You know, we vote on the judges, and then the judges pick, but then people vote. So are the winners? You know, there's there's people going to they say either which way. But for the moment, the innies are probably the premier tabletop gaming ceremony. Not counting streams and podcasts, that's kind of their own thing. There's been several new things that have popped up that specifically cater to streaming shows, live shows, that kind of thing. But as far as like a book with rules, dice, maps, art, layout, the innies are as, as prestigious as you can get. So my first thought was, did I really write that good of a book or are the innies not that good? And they're just, they don't know what they're doing. Like I, that, that was my, my first moment is that anxiety of, oh, these people are crazy. They don't know what they're doing. There's no way my book should be nominated for it, especially under best rules. Okay. Again, I know I'm going in circles. Honest to God, the only reason I submitted is I thought we had a chance with the art. Like, I love this cover. I mean, I know there's some covers on other books that are absolutely gorgeous, but I think this art absolutely captures what the game is. Absolutely. Plus, it's yeah. just beautiful. So it, you know, it hundred percent matches the vision I have and for what you get, you know, it, the, the box, the tin Mac matches what's, what's inside. So I submitted it thinking we might have a shot for the cover art and the interior art. Also, I think it, it totally matches exactly what I wanted. So I thought maybe we'll get a nod for art. And when you submit, I think you just kind of submit for everything. Mm -hmm. I had zero expectations that I would get any sort of recognition outside the slim possibility of art. So the fact that I got nominated for best rules, again, completely flabbergasted. I'm honored. I'm surprised. I'm kind of confused, but it's still <laughs> exciting. What about um, in, in terms of, so that's the Ennis, but what about in terms, do you, do you, are you following up? I believe you are, but are you following via Indie Press Revolution, but are you following up, uh, you know, the fulfillment of the Kickstarter with, with brick and mortar, friendly local game shops, and so on, and you know, because that's that's also an interesting conveyor belt of of work and deciding whether or not you print mo print more and so on. So, uh, have you been getting on with that as well? Uh, 
to a point. Uh, so again, so the, so the Kickstarter is 100% fulfilled. If, if somebody backed it, they got their copies. Um, after the Kickstarter, I did partner with Indie Press Revolution, so they are carrying the book. So if you go to Indie Press Revolutions, you can buy the book from them. Um, I sent them, I think about 250. I think I printed 500. And I think I had 160 that sold through the Kickstarter. So that was like 340 beyond the Kickstarter. Um, so I sent them, I think, 250. I kept the rest. Some of I've given away. I sent six to the innies. I gave a couple to the public library. You know, I've done a few things with them. Um, but you can you can buy the book through Indie Press Revolution. You can buy the PDF through Drive Through, or you can buy the book or the PDF through me. I have my own website, the RPG Academy. If you buy it from me. I get 100% of the money. If you go through IPR or drive through, they get like 50% of it. So it's actually better for me if you buy it from me, but it's nice to let them handle it. But game stores buy their products through IPR. So like I have not gone to a game store and said, hey, will you buy my book and sell it? But some game stores have went to IPR and bought the book and are now carrying it in their stores. So it's one thing I've seen you do really well is like you'll go on, on social media and you're like, hey, this new game store is carrying my book and you do like a little thing and talk about the game store. And I'm like, that is so cool. I have no idea which game stores are carrying mine because I don't I don't see that. You but don't Google it? <laughs> you just Google it. it and you find out. <laughs> yeah, no, I, but again, I'm in the middle of Podunk, Kentucky. Like the, there's two, there's only game stores that are physically close enough to me to sell it wouldn't carry this book anyway. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's two things really. Uh, ju just coming back, what, uh, you're, you're right. I, I mean, I do it for two reasons, <laughs> or three, I guess. Uh, the first reason is that it makes me incredibly happy whenever I see a game store uh, taking uh, one of my games. Uh, it's been the case with Paris Gondo. Uh, stores around the world uh, really it fills me with joy so I want to share the joy so I like to make a visual and say the thing the the other reason is that uh, I'm f genuinely thankful for that uh, so I want to help the game store uh, be seen and uh, and uh, seen by people who might be interested in my game so they get a copy and the third reason is that if the copies fly off the shelf quickly from that game store they are more likely to, to take more But uh, yeah, yes. little trick for... So right now with Rosewood Abbey, uh, because different reasons, I haven't sent copies to Indie Press Revolution yet, uh, in large part because I'm in the UK, not in the US, so it's right. quite expensive. And logistically, it's a bit complicated to send 80 copies. Should be simpler with Rosewood Abbey, which is a book, than, Rosewood Abbey, than Paris Gondo, which was a box with stones in it and cards and right. so on, and it's not the same tag, so it was a lot of stress. But uh, So I'm concentrating to stores in London right now, where and I give them a discount, the discount which is you don't have shipping to pay because I'm going to show up at your door in person. Uh, right. because I even... Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a big discount on transport in London through my work, so you know it takes time for me to go there, but it's a pleasure. But yeah, otherwise uh, it's a bit arcane to find your way through there, but you can find out via Indie Press Revolution what store bought your games, so you can find them there. And otherwise, Google. I did not know that. Yeah, it's it's really weird, and to be honest, I shouldn't be saying. That here, but on on a couple of occasions, I was like, "Am I supposed to have access to that?" Uh, I'm not abusing it, but I was like, "This this is a bit weird that I got access to that amount of information." Uh, I mean, not not personal data, but yeah, I was like, "Okay, uh, that that's still a, a off air." I want you to show me how to do that because <laughs> I I do not know how because I I get the quarterly reports, but it just has a number. It was yeah number yeah yeah copies were sold to. It just is game, like under game store category, so there's no no names or anything. But otherwise, um, uh, so I just say, I just oh, type on you type you type the title of your game between uh, uh, quotation mark on Google uh, every month or every week, depending on uh, or stress you are, uh, and you can set the search so that it shows only the last thing that showed up that is new from last month or the last week. And you find out about stores uh, this way, and then then you check on their website if indeed it's in store, and uh, and then you you share uh, the news uh, to your followers. It's it's really uh, in French we say huile de coude, uh, which means uh, yeah, sweat. <laughs> Just work on that. Okay. All right, I, I will definitely look into that because that, that's one thing that has been because I mean obviously the book hasn't like 
sold in droves. I mean, I think I've probably sold like maybe 50, 60 copies total since the Kickstarter, which isn't nothing, you know, but it's still not like they're flying off the shelves or anything. But it has been kind of a desire because I, I do travel around a little bit for work and for other things I've done. So I always try to find the game store if I go to a new city and I've, I've had the opportunity to visit a couple new cities lately. And so I've gone to these game stores with just sort of this like hope, like maybe this will be the time where I just see my book in the wild. Like I had nothing to do with it. I didn't sell it to them, but they ordered it and it's in there. And I want to take a picture with me inside the store with my book on the shelf. Unfortunately, that has not happened. And then I went to Origins. Origins is a game convention in Columbus, Ohio. It's about 20,000 people. So it's significantly smaller than Gen Con, but I think that's also way smaller than your um, UK meet, right? Like, isn't... Uh, I mean, the, this two, uh, uh, the, the one I keep talking about here is UK Games Expo, which is uh, the break record this year. So it's the third largest, uh, unless Origins beats it this year, but it's going to be... A, quite a challenge a uh, little story uh, okay games expo happens a little bit every year uh, a little bit of time every year before origins so traditionally mm. what happened is that uk games expo like uh, if you are in 2024 uh, uk games expo 2024 would be bigger than origins 2023 because they all kept gotcha. growing okay and then a f little while afterwards origin 2024 would take back its third spot in the top so we're quite gotcha, curious to okay. see if it's going to be the case this year because expo did absolutely fantastic uh, numbers but uk games expo is a tabletop convention gaming so there's a lot of card gaming board gaming uh, yeah. a, a very a rather limited share of that is, is tabletop uh then we've got dragon okay. meat in london which is like 80 90 percent role-playing game but it's a one-day event and it's way smaller it's way smaller than origins uh, as well gotcha okay uh so the the point of my sad story i'm about to get to so so indie press revolution goes to a lot of these conventions they set up booths and they sell these games so i went to origins and i was like i'm gonna take a picture of me at the booth with my game they didn't they didn't have copies they didn't take any action 12 cinema to origins and like, I get it. Like they sell all kinds of books and they have their darlings. They have the ones that are selling, but it was a little, like it, it did hit my heart a little bit. So I emailed uh, IPR. I was like, you know, I was very nice about it. I was like, Hey, I just, you know, I, I was hoping this would happen. Can you tell me if it will be at Gen Con or not? And if it matters, I'm going to Gen Con and I'm going to be doing a panel. I will plug my book to try to help get sales. And they're like, Oh yeah, if you're going, yeah, we'll definitely take a few copies. Well, then the innies were announced. So then I emailed them back. I was like, oh, did you see? My book is also any nominated. So I, I, you know, can you take like a bunch of copies? Like whatever. Uh, so ultimately I do know that they will have copies of my book for Gen Con uh, that I will be, have a chance. Hopefully, well, hopefully they'll sell out before I get in there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up at some point and see if I can take a picture uh, of my book for sale at Gen Con. So it was a little bit of sting to the heart that it wasn't there for Origins, but at Gen Con, which is the biggest North American gaming convention, it's it's a super big deal that it's there, there that it will be there then. It will have the nominated for an Innies like little sticker thing on it they put up. So I'm very hopeful that they will sell out of all their copies. And I, so at this point, I have roughly about 200 copies left. If I can sell a hundred of those, I'm going to go ahead and do a, a reprint because there we did catch one mistake that was in the book. One of the charts got duplicated. So one was left out and one was put in twice. Um, mm -hmm. And then the barcode that I used was given to me by a friend and something was wrong. So this barcode doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. So I had to buy a new barcode. <laughs> so the updated version will have the correct barcode. Uh, so I'd like to do a second printing, but unless something just drastically changes and like those sell out, I don't expect I'll ever print another copy of the book. It's funny, I, I don't have a barcode. I should look into that someday. Uh, yeah, an another thing for, for people out there who've got their game with Indie Press Revolution or, or considering doing it, uh, what is public is on Indie Press Revolution, they got a web page which lists all the stores in the world, uh, a lot of the vast majority is in the US, but in the world, that have a partnership with them. So uh, it's... I. For instance, for Paris Gondo, and uh, once Rose Dhabi is with uh, Indie Press Revolution, again, I will do it, is that I went through that list, found the details, the, the email of each of these stores, as many as I could, and I emailed them, each of them, saying, 
Hello, we know that you are in partnership with Indie Press Revolution. Please know that now you can stock copies of our game via Indie Press Revolution because you know they they're comfortable with Indie Press Revolution. They they know that the shipping's gonna go well. They know that Indie Press Revolution is gonna usually not stock a game which is absolute rubbish. Uh, so yeah, just raising that with them is quite good. And uh, what uh, I w was made aware of uh, is that um, stores, uh, I mean, stating the obvious here, I guess, but I didn't think of that before uh, I, I got access to this information. Uh, they, they don't order one game, uh, obviously. The, uh, in the case of Paris Gondo, sometimes it will ho uh, order one copy of Paris Gondo, but it's part of an order which is goes between $200 to uh, $2,000, because what they're doing is that they're taking two copies of a bunch load of things, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. to restock, sometimes to, to new. So when you, you tell them, hey, my game is there, you know, in the big pictures for them, it's somewhat not that much to say, huh, I'm going to add it to the order. Just one copy of Action 12 Cinema, one copy of Rosewood Abbey, and they find out what it is, and then they, they sell it, and they see if it goes. So, yeah, it's worth it's worth having a like, look at the, that email address, uh, at that list, I think, uh, on Indie Press Revolution, and, and reaching out to stores to tell them, hey, look, uh, uh, my game is there. You can get it there where, with that partner you're familiar with. And if you do, please let me know, and I, I will I will shout out about you uh, and and doing it because yeah, of course I want you to say, to to be uh, successful. I should do it this week while it's still any nominated. Because if I if I don't win, that'll go away. But right now, I could be like, hey, this book any nominated? Get your copies now. All right. Yeah. Great. Uh, what else? Is there something else? Oh, yeah, I know what, something else. I'm going I'm to pull an exclusive out of you, I Ooh. guess. Oh, no. Because I, you know, that's the thing. I got access to a number of things, including private channels on some discords. Sure. And I, I saw the name of a channel there. I didn't go there. Is there a follow-up to Action 12 Cinema in the works? So I... I've always been sort of a hobbyist game designer. I think I think anybody who runs games does at some point you start to tinker around. And like I've so I'm always thinking about things. I do have like four different like concepts. I'm kind of just playing around. Like, I got, it might be years in my head. Because Action 12 Cinema was in my head for quite a long time. I just had it one to my, uh, you know, I, might, I got my Google Drive when I got everything. And I just, when I have an idea, I save it there. And I had it a new one today. So, yeah, I know the Ooh. feeling. <laughs> yeah, I don't so think. I, yeah, I've got a couple of games that I'm, like, tinkering with. But, like, nothing is anywhere near the, like, I'm going to sit down and write a game. But there are some things I'm working on. And I, and I will admit, when I got the any nomination and it came under best rules, I started thinking, like, maybe I, because I... And again, I'm not trying to just, just be self-deprecating, but like I, I've tried to compare my game. Have you ever played the game, The Mind, the card yes. game? Yes, yes. Okay. So the first time I played The Mind, I was simultaneously angry. You should and explain envious. it for people who haven't played it. Okay. So The Mind is a, it's a very fun, fast card game. It's just a deck of cards. Each card is numbered one. Through, not not each card, but the cards are numbered one through a hundred. So you have a hundred cards, one one with one, one with twelve, one with a hundred. And the object is to play the cards in the correct order from lowest number to highest number, but you're not allowed to talk about what card you have. Because then it would be very easy. You're like, well, I have a seven, I have a four, you play first. It's it's more of like just kind of feeling things out and like no one seems to be moving. So I guess my seven must be the lowest card. It sounds super simple because it is, but it's actually a ton of fun. And I was so angry that some game designer dude or dudette had the audacity to say they created a game when it's just a deck of cards that goes one to a hundred and then envious because it is such a fun game. Like they took, they took such a simple concept, but they turned it into a fun game. And that has been sort of my North star for action 12 cinema. I don't think there's anything revolutionary about my game other than it uses D12 because those are the best die. But it's a roll on charts, get an outline, roll a, a pool, dice pool, high numbers are better. Like there's nothing I've created that is revolutionary. But I did create a, a, a list of activities that you can put together and have a ton of fun. 
And at the end of the game, you will have laughs and maybe tears from the laughs and, and, you know, remembering these story moments, things that have happened. So I, I don't think I've done anything unique, but I did find a way to take something that already existed, like a deck of cards, one to a hundred and make a fun game out of it. So the fact that it's up for best rules is kind of shocking to me. I would love to sit down with the judges and find out what it was specifically, if anything, that they thought was particularly noteworthy. Uh, but I do think it's a fun game, and that's all I was trying to do. So it's, it's been very validating. So since the any noms have come out, I have started thinking, maybe I have a talent at this. Maybe I shouldn't just think of this as uh, something I do for fun. Like, I don't need it to be my job. I'm not going to turn it into my job, but... <laughs> I've, I've made more work on all four of those other games in the last couple of weeks than I had over the last year. I'll tell you that. I, I must say, I, I, I mean, my experience also has been that we get, I mean, you, you're, the RPG Academy is way more successful than the Rollist uh, has ever been a, okay. as a show. Uh, but I found that game design was more immediately uh, rewarding. Uh, because uh, you have much more feedback from people who buy it and 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 play it than you do from the podcast. I got people seem more naturally to take at least a picture when they get their copy in the mail and post it gotcha. to you. Why on podcast you go you see those numbers which are higher than the number of copies I sold of Paris Gondo or Rosewood Abbey, but uh, people don't don't leave many reviews and stuff like that right. or or react that much to the, as a, to the podcast as uh, I would hope be hoping for so yeah uh, game designer uh, uh, for me as a hobby and it, it's great and it's very motivating to get feedback from individuals or in your case in organization say hey yeah that's quite good actually go ahead and uh, and please do do more uh that that's an instant uh highly motivating thing someone was posting earlier today uh, on blue sky saying hey uh you know post about your games and tag the designers because there's nothing that is more rewarding for them uh and it's entirely true I had a chance, I, I did a podcast just a few weeks ago. It's someone who's developing a podcast. So it was sort of like a pilot sort of thing. So I don't know if that audio will ever actually come out. Uh, so I don't want to say anything in case it doesn't. But I mentioned that I played a game of theirs like eight or nine years ago. That was an influence on my game. And they had no idea that I even knew their game exists. So it, so it became this really fun moment for them to realize that not only had I played their game, but their game had had a positive impact on me and led to the creation in some part to my game, which has now been any recognized. Um, so it was, you, you, you had know, to rub it on them. Your any nomination. Well, no, I just meant <laughs> I, as, as a thank you, because to your point, like we don't do that enough. We don't just say, I played this game and I loved it, you know, whether it's because it's a big company like wizards of the coast and who, who are we going to tag or it's like a podcast with a thousand listeners. But yeah, if you, if you pick up a game off the shelf and you play it and you have a good time, I'm sure somewhere in there, there's going to be a Twitter handle, an email or something. Let people know, leave reviews on podcasts because it, it means the world to us. It really does. All right. Um, okay. So no superhero action 12 cinema coming soon then. No, nothing directly <laughs> related. Uh, but again, D12s are the best. If I make any game, the only thing I will promise you is it will heavily involve a D12 or more D12s because I truly love them. I think they're the best die. Um, I have a few games I'm tinkering with. We'll see. But it, it's no okay. Promises. I can hack it to use two D6s or D10. I'm sure it works as well. I mean, <laughs> if you want to ruin it, sure. Yeah, you could do that. What do you mean if I want to ruin it? I think... If I picked up Action 12 Cinema and turned it in Action 10 Cinema, if I was having fun, I would be doing it you, right. You would, in fact, be doing it right, <laughs> but you would be doing it less right in the D12. Uh, in case it wasn't clear, let me throw in that last plug. The innies are currently voting. I think, I know you, I'm almost positive you mentioned at the top, uh, that once you're nominated, it becomes a fan vote. So it's just popularity contest, which is why I have almost no shot of winning because I'm up against companies that have, you know, they sold thousands and thousands, if not millions of copies of their games. I've sold a hundred. Uh, but if I have any shot at all of actually getting up on stage and getting a little medal that I will have forever bragging rights, I need people to vote for me. 
It's open voting. I'm sure you'll have links in the show notes, but if anyone would please consider voting for Action 12 Cinema under the best rules category, I would absolutely appreciate it. Remember me, are you at the moment twice any nominated or are you already a recipient of an any for the podcast? So I, I was nominated twice for the podcast. Both times we did not place because they nominate five mm. top two goat getters get recognized with a gold and silver medal. So I have the distinction of being the third to fifth best, best podcast <laughs> two years in a row. Uh, and technically action 12 cinema is actually nominated twice uh, once under best rules, but because we were nominated under best rules, we were automatically put into the, the favorite publication or favorite, oh. favorite publisher category. So you can also vote for plus D12 games um, there, but that's, that's really not merit. I mean, I guess it's merit based because I got in because of the other nomination, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Action 12 Center rules and then plus D12 games is under fan favorite publisher. So you could technically vote for me twice. Okay, cool. Well, please go ahead and do that. Go vote for Michael. I will put a, a link to that in the description of the episode or whether you watch it on YouTube or uh, listen to the podcast. Otherwise, if you just have any award, we don't have a direct link when you can go and automatically it votes for Michael. You will have to go through the list. You don't have to reply to everything. You just vote to whatever category and, and folks uh, you support. So don't don't spend your time voting for stuff you have no clue about. Uh, that would take an awful lot of time and also it would be unfair to other categories. Uh, yeah, just go there and vote for, for, for Michael or something else. <laughs> the more votes, the, the merrier. Absolutely. Vote, vote for whoever you would like to support. I just asking if you don't have anyone else to support, support me. Uh, so we're recording this on July 14th. Voting closes on July 21st. So there's roughly a week left uh, and then voting closes. And then the ceremony is at Gen Con August 2nd or 3rd. I don't remember which, the Friday night of, of Gen Con, uh, which I will be at. So I will be there, win or shine or win or lose, I'll be there uh, reporting on it through my TikToks. Are they still asking for a music soundtrack? Like when, when I applied, they, they asked for an MP3 that they would play when they called you to stage or announce so, your winning. So when my podcast was nominated, this this has been several years ago. I think actually my, it came up in my Facebook fa uh, memories. It was seven and eight years ago because we were nominated two years in a row. They asked for a music prompt and I was expecting to maybe put one together for this and they haven't yet. So I assume they just don't do that anymore. <laughs> I think they live stream them now, so they probably don't have the right to play. <laughs> oh, <them>. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, where, do we, where can people find you when you wish to be found? Yeah, again, thank you for having me on here. I know this isn't a show that you do a lot right now, and you kind of did this as a personal favor, so I absolutely do appreciate you, buddy. Thank you so much. I um, got a Kickstarter coming. <laughs> I got a Kickstarter yeah, coming. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I, I... <laughs> absolutely. Yes, we will, we will pay it forward, pay it back, whatever. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of off Twitter, so I really, I don't enjoy being there anymore. So I'm, I think I'm pretty much done. So really emailing me is the easiest way to get a hold of me. If you want to talk about Farm to Fable, which is my Smallville show, you can email smallvillefancast at gmail.com. Uh, the RPG Academy is the RPG podcast. So just the RPG Academy at Gmail. I have a Facebook page for both of those. Uh, really, I, I have enjoyed TikTok so far. I might get to the point where I don't like TikTok anymore, but right now it's still fun. Uh, so you can find me on TikTok if you search at the RPG Academy, it will find me. Do you but publish? Do you account... do, do you do you do videos yourself? Yes. Oh yeah, wow! I videos. didn't realize. I don't that. do skits. I don't do. <laughs> it's just me talking. So it's like it's like a one minute podcast basically. So yeah, not getting a thousand or a million followers over there at any time. Do you do, you do the uh, you... the TikToking while driving? And it's like no, I hate that. <laughs> I, I, I do it from my car a lot because like I'll I have a little phone holder but I never I'm never my car is never moving okay. when I record these but safety first good doing that yeah I'm like I'm like why are you talking while you're driving so yes don't do that but, but do you do the uh, stop thing while like waiting for the kids coming out of school with your big cup of coffee and you're like uh, in your car talking to your phone no, no, I, I, it, it was kind of weird actually because I, again I went to Origins and I had planned on doing a lot of like um, check-ins, mm. but I have found that being in a public space, 
Like it's one thing if I come in my car, I can point my phone, I can talk to my phone. That's fine. Again, I'm talking on Zoom. I kind of have trained myself to do this. But being in a public space talking to my phone was weird. And I got this weird anxiety and I could not do it. I did not do any live from origin videos. I go back to the hotel and then post about stuff, but I could not actually do it just in the middle of a bunch of people. It just it freaked me out for some reason. So no, I I, I have to be alone. It's private time to do my TikTok. If I'm interviewing people, that's different. I interviewed a couple of vendors, but just like in a crowded room talking to my phone, I, I don't know. My brain was just like, nope, not doing that, buddy. All right. Great. Uh, and there's a... Uh, weird way to end the show. Anyway, thanks for having me, buddy. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Uh, yeah, we should hang out more. Uh, I miss uh, doing stuff uh, with the Academy. We should play games. We should play games. Yeah, I should run Rosu Adabi for you. That would be that would be interesting. And you should run Action 12 Cinema for me again. Or we should play together since there's no... Exactly. Uh, it's gamer. GMless. We all get to play. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you. Cheers.